deep learning and AI, it's all around the news. It's sometimes scary, it's for sure mystical, and well, you know, media is like trying to scare every, everybody, and especially in, in, you know, Elon Musk, right? He's always talking like crazy things are gonna happen if we, if we keep building AIs. But what is this deep learning? What the hack is deep learning? And so, hello, I'm Rafael Erdog, and I have a confession to make. I have nothing to do with data science. I'm actually an agile coach and team lead. And the reason I give this talk is because last Christmas, I decided I want to find out what the heck is deep learning. And that journey that I took was quite interesting. And I, want, I wanted to share this journey with you. And second, uh, I really found that the more I started to know about this technology, the more excited I got, and the more relaxed I got about the future. So, what you can expect from this talk? Well, first of all, I want to make sure that you are not scared anymore, <laughs> okay? So that's the first thing. Second thing is I want to make sure that you have a basic understanding of what this technology is good for, and I want to make you excited to learn more. Sounds good? All right, so by the end of the talk, this is what we are going to do. We will have a piece of software that can recognize numbers, handwritten numbers. That's like not a big deal. We can maybe do that by hand. But the technique I will show you for doing that will be very general. You, you can apply this to recognizing cats from dogs, okay? So you can write a program, you show it a, a picture and tell you if it's a cat or a dog. You can, show, uh, you can use the same technology that I'm gonna show you in the same techniques to identify cancerous cells on an X-ray, which is freaking awesome, right? So by the end of the talk, we will do this. This is where I'm gonna uh, aim for. But first, let's talk about what deep learning can do for you. Well, imagine that you are tasked with an image processing software that has to take a picture and it has to tell uh, the rest of the software where a face is. So we have to do face detection, right? So how, how would you do that if you were a programmer? A regular programmer would start writing code and in the end, you would, uh, that code would generate a bounding box. Okay, but what code would you write? What would you fill in with that? And put your hands up if you're a programmer. Come on, yeah, you're a programmer, okay. Uh, keep it up, keep it up, keep it up, okay. So you're a programmer, okay. Keep it up if you know how to write this software. Oh, get, that's good, okay, few, few people know, okay. <laughs> uh, so, so the thing is, it's, it's not, not easy and it's not intuitive. And the trick is that even if you, if you do deep learning and, and you can solve this problem with deep learning, but even if you do solve it, you will not have a single idea how that software does it. It will just do it, <laughs> okay? And the way it works is that we are going to replace that one picture with 100,000 pictures. And for each of those pictures, we will have the bounding box manually created. Uh, who knows uh, Amazon Mechanical Torque? Okay, so Mechanical Torque is just what it, the name implies. It's a, a software where you can send a, an API call with a task. And the task is being uh, processed by some poor guy who, who actually has to go uh, through it manually, and then he submits the result through another API. So you can actually uh, make it look like an AI is doing something, but in reality, it's just a, a human who <laughs> uh, actually does that uh, task. Uh, so basically what you can do is just take 100,000 pictures of uh, faces, send it to Mechanical Torque, and now you have data to learn from. And once you have that, then you will have, I will show you a piece of software, it's called Keras 
that can turn that data into an algorithm that just, just that does just that. And that's just one example. You could do the same thing with image recognition. So for example, this piece of software can tell what's the main thing on the image. Uh, of course, it makes mistakes, like uh, here, uh, the Dalmatian turned out to be cherry. But you know, nothing is perfect. But, but that's, that's what you can do with it. Uh, or you can go further and actually segment the picture. So here, here is the original picture, and then uh, the AI actually told us which parts are the road, where are the cars, where are the buildings, the humans, stuff like that. You can imagine how that's useful for uh, self-driving cars, right? So that's, that's pretty awesome stuff. Or you could recolor images. So what you do there is you take a lot of colored images, turn them into black and white images, and then tell the AI to learn uh, how a recolored image looks like after, after uh, it's being fed a black and white photo. And, and that's, I find that particularly interesting because here we have lost data, right? We have lost the color data entirely and we are rebuilding that data. And what the AI does is actually learns uh, what kind of uh, parts of the image should look what color. So it actually gets the skin color right, for example. And of course, we all know the old joke from every C CSI and uh, similar shows when they, where they say, hey, can you zoom on that part? All right, enhance it. And we were all laughing. The thing is, there is a software that can do that by now. Of course, again, it's not going to rebuild mis uh, missing information. What it does is it can generate, for, from an 8 by 8 pixelated image, it can generate an uh, image of the face that looks very similar to the person who was photographed or originally, which I, again, find both exciting and a bit scary. <laughs> Uh, and another interesting thing, you can build, uh, you use the IMDb reviews and find out if people are happy about the movie or not just from reading the text. So uh, on IMDb, you have both the review and a rating, and then you can teach your AI to, to read the text and then turn that into a rating without having the rating information. All right. So... That sounds cool. How does it work? Uh, so what I'm going to do now, uh, <laughs> I, I, I was just telling this uh, yesterday, the speakers uh, to others, that what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do two things that I hate when uh, speakers do that. One, I'm going to show you code, <laughs> uh, and I'm going to talk about the specific technology. I will try to pull that off. But <laughs> so from this point on, we will have some code, but not very scary ones. Uh, so what, how does this whole thing work? Well, to, to understand how deep learning works, we should first look at a simpler problem, a much simpler problem, because then I can build up uh, to more complex problems, OK? So our simple program is fuel levels in my car. So I go fill up my tank. When I fill it up, there is 40 liters of, on, of gasoline in it. I drive a certain amount of kilometers, and then I have what amount of gasoline left. That's what I want to learn. Uh, or, well, maybe I want to write a software for this. And if I want to write a software for this, then probably I would get some kind of function that is like a, a, a straight line, because that data just looks like a straight line. And that, that is actually something you can do manually, right? So actually, I did write this function. It's really simple. It's just uh, multiplication and an addition. OK, that's cool. Uh, so if we had just problems like that, we didn't, wouldn't need deep learning. But sometimes the data doesn't look that nice. For example, here we have a data that also seems to fit a line, but it's noisy. It's not exactly fitting the line. So now what I can do? Well, probably that noise is not important, so I just want a line again. But this time, if I just uh, connect the first and last dot, that's not optimal. It's, it's, it's pretty obvious that it's not the same slope as the data implies. So we, sh we should have something more steep, right? Uh, OK, so how can we deal with, it, deal with that? Well, one thing we know, our function will look something like this. 
we will have some W and some B, and, and that's it. But we don't know what, what those two numbers are. What, what is W and what is B? So we want to find it out. So how do we do that? Well, first we need to define what a good fit is. When, when are we happy with this line? And the way we do that is by measuring the distance of each point from the line. Okay? So this is just simple subtraction. You take uh, the dot up there and, and uh, the point where, it join, uh, where it's closest to the line and measure this distance. And that's the code for it. So I created a new function, this f underscore, and then for each w and b uh, and i, which is the index of the point, I can just calculate the distance. Then I can do that for every point in, in our data. So that's going to be a for loop. We add those errors all up. And now, if you look closely, we have a function with two parameters and one output, one, one error output. So what I can do with a function with two parameters, I can do a 3D plot. And that's what that function looks, looks like on a 3D plot. And there you have like a valley, right? That's, there is some deepest point down there. And if you choose the W and the B that corresponds to the deepest point, what you get is a line like this. So that sounds nice. That actually looks like it, it, fit, it fits the data. So this, this technique is actually pretty old. It's called linear regression. And data scientists have been using it for a long, long time. But data is usually not like that. Data is usually not a simple line. What if it looks like this? How am I going to write a function that fits this data? Well, I can do something similar if someone from up heavens told me that, that this, this function looks like this and just didn't tell me the A and B. That would be pretty easy, because then I could just draw another nice plot, look for the valley down there, yeah, and then, then that's it, right? We, we now have a, a function that fits there. But that's not very convenient, right? Because uh, most of the time we don't have like some kind of function that, that in mind uh, that might fit our data. And we don't have like uh, uh, a magical uh, elf who, who is going to tell that to us. So we, we should come up with something more general. How could we, what, what could we do about that? Well, the trick is basically this really small little function called ReLU. Uh, it's really simple. Uh, when, it's, uh, when the number is smaller than zero, it returns zero. Otherwise, it returns a number. I can even show you the code. Really nice. OK, so we have this function. It will be useful, because now I'm going to write another function that looks like this. We will have, you know, this part this, that, that's inside the value. It's, uh, it's, an, it's basically a, a straight line. And then if we apply the value, and then we combine multiple of these. And what we get is like a, a, a function like this. Why is this function interesting? But the reason it's interesting is because if you build up functions like this, like lots of them, then there is a, a theorem that tells that you can approximate any function. So basically, this is, this is if, if you have enough of these, not like four, but like hundreds of these or thousands of these, then you can actually uh, find a, a function that fits your data in theory. We will see how it works in practice. But at this point, it be, it's starting to become really complex. So I don't want to write all that code uh, manually, especially because they wouldn't fit, fit on the slide anymore. So I'm going to use a library called Keras. And Keras is basically a deep learning library. And the, the interesting thing about its design is that it's designed to make simple things simple. 
which is awesome, right? We, we have heard in the keynote, Venkat's beautiful keynote, that simplicity is important. Well, Keras is, everything is simple in Keras. Everything that's simple is simple, or simple to do, okay. So, let's look at how Keras works, and, 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 and for that I'm gonna go back to this first example of, of a simp simple line. How would you do this in, in Keras? Well, the way to do this in Keras is this. You create a sequential model. I'm not gonna tell you what the sequential model is at this point, I'm gonna talk about it later. But the important part is that dense. And that dense says that I'm gonna, uh, it's, it's basically a generalized version of a, of a line. Uh, but for now, since we, both dimensions are one, uh, it's, it's basically just saying that I'm looking for a line to fit my data. And then what you do is you compile that, uh, model, uh, we have two parameters here. One is the optimizer. The optimizer is the thing that is going to look for the deepest point in your error function, okay? So you, we are not going to eyeball uh, 3D plots anymore, especially because our data or, or a function will have more than two parameters. It will have hundreds of parameters or millions of parameters. So we need uh, a smart algorithm to find that lowest point. And that algorithm that I'm gonna use is called NADAM. That's like currently the state of the art. Uh, we started with SGD and then move, moved on. Uh, basically, the only difference between them is how, how they are looking for that lowest point. And then the other thing I'm gonna use is called mean squared error, is the loss or the error. It's, it's basically just a way of measuring how far uh, our uh, function is from the observed data. And yeah, it's, it's almost the same that what, what we used before. And then, this is, this is the actual learning part. So this is where we learn from the data. When we call this fit function. And then what, what we do is we are going to uh, add two uh, arrays. One is called input and the other is called output. And both arrays like contain hundreds of data points. And one is like, in, in the case of uh, number recognition, one would be the images of numbers, and the other would be uh, w which number is on that index position. Okay, so we fit the data, and then we use predict to get. So basically, this is the part where we are already using uh, our model. In this case, uh, it will just return uh, a value that it, it thinks is, is suitable for our, our learned data. And what it will look like is this. That looks good, okay. So again, uh, we now use Keras to do the same thing as we did before manually and with eyeballing. Okay, now next thing I wanna talk about is what this dance thing can do for us. So if you do dance one input shape one, then it will search for a function that looks like w times x plus b. So this is a simple line. This, this is the simplest case. Now if I change the input shape to two, then what I'm gonna get is a function with two parameters uh, and this form, like w1 times x1 plus w2 times x2 plus b. Uh, so here we generalized from one parameter, one output to two parameter, one output. Similarly, we can generalize the other way, having one parameters and two outputs, in which case we basically get two lines. And finally, we can generalize both ways. So for example, two inputs, two outputs, and the function that we, were, we, we are going to get looks like this. And finally, I have to show you this other so-called layers. When we have sequential models and, and these uh, things in between, these are called layers, the dance and activation, they are, they are called layers. And the activation uh, ReLU layer is just going to take all parameters and apply ReLU to all of them and then re return it as a list. Okay, so now we have everything that we need. We can go back to our original uh, curvy data problem. And what I'm gonna do is this, I'm gonna have a dance layer with one input, 
2,000 outputs. So now we have like a huge array of numbers generated from that one number. Uh, we are going to activate it with a ReU. So now we throw away everything that is below zero. And then we are going to just combine all those numbers into one single number with multiplication and, and summation. And what we get if we, again, compile the model, fit it with, on the data, and predict, what we get is this. Well, that looks shitty. Because, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's nothing like uh, the original data. Well, it, at parts, it, I mean, here between 0 .0, uh, 0 0.2 and 0 0.4, it looks kind of good, but most of it is, is just not so good. Why is that? Well, the reason is because my, my model isn't complex enough. I just used one dense layer, an activation, and another dense layer. And what's typical of using deep learning is that when you make your first try, it's going to fail horribly. Every time you do the first model, it's going to fail. And then you scratch your head, look at the data, it's either going to say, show, seem like you have too much layers or you have too little layers, uh, and you basically just have to experiment. And when you do that, for example, in this case, my next experiment was this. I added one more dense layer and one more activation. So what, not, what I do now is I have one number, 2,000 numbers, generate another 2,000 numbers from those numbers, and then get one number out at the end. And in, in between, we throw out the, the, everything that's below zero twice. And when I compile, fit, and predict that mo model, again, we get something like this. And that's, that's, that's already nice. But the important message here is we have to experiment. Oops. OK, so we have to experiment. It's not like straightforward. There is no uh, really clever stuff going on here. Like, I didn't really know what model is going to work, or I didn't have any. It, it was just a hunch. And then I played around with it until I get some acceptable results. OK? Uh, OK. So now we can go back to image recognition. But for that, uh, for, for recognizing more numbers, we will have to, yeah, this is, this is the problem. Again, just a reminder, this is what we want to do. We have handwritten numbers. We want to make uh, the, the digital version of that. So we need two tricks. One, one trick is that we are not just going to predict which number is on there, but we are going to tell how likely, how sure we are about that number. So in this case, if you have this handwritten five, we are going to say something like, I'm 99% sure that this is a five. We are actually going to go even further than that. We are going to tell for each number how likely that number is. So in this case, we have almost all zeros. It's not a zero, not a one, not a two. It's probably a five, maybe with a slight chance of six. That's, that's what we are going to get. So what we are going to feed our neural network are the pictures and vectors like this, where everything is zero except for the index where, where the number should be. So in this case, index five is five because this is a handwritten five. And now that we have that, we need another trick. And the other trick is image filters. And these are actually Photoshop filters that I'm going to show you. A very specific kind of Photoshop filter called convolutions. And why are convolutions interesting? Well, we can do a lot of interesting stuff with them. Uh, we can do sharpening. That, that's the, so the first one is the original image. The second one is a sharpening. Uh, of course, the image was originally sharp, so we don't, didn't change much. But yeah, that, <laughs> that didn't work well. But uh, we have Gaussian blur, square blur. We have this emboss effect, which is also done in, in Photoshop. Uh, and these are really interesting. But the really, really interesting part for us are the last two ones, the edge detection ones. So you can actually create an edge detection with with uh, convolutions. And because of that, uh, people who worked with image recognition back in the 80s 
already know, knew that these convolutions are going to be interesting. They just didn't know how to use them. Okay? And here is what a convolution is. It's fairly simple. Uh, what we have is like, this is the original image. I'm going to try to show this with, with uh, Corsair. So this is the original image. It's a, it's a table of numbers, right? Every pixel is a number. And then we will have this smaller table of numbers, which is called a kernel in this case. And this kernel, this uh, filter kernel, is just a bunch of, bunch of, num <laughs> just a bunch of numbers. And that what we do is we are going to put that filter or kernel on every single uh, block of numbers that it fits. So for example, this is a three by three filter. So we are going to put it here in the corner, this three, three by three filter. And what we are going to do is we are going to multiply the numbers that fall on each other and then sum the whole thing up. So in this case, we get something like minus one times three plus zero times zero, et cetera, okay? So this is a, a convolution, and it turns out that these simple things can, can actually do pretty com complex stuff. All right, and now back to Keras. So what I have here, this conf2d, is the Keras way of saying, give me a convolution. And what it will do is, oh, sorry, we will not, we, these numbers in the filter, that's what we are looking for. This, this, this is the thing that Keras is going to tell us. We are not going to tell these numbers. This is unknown. And Keras will find us numbers that work well. Okay? And now I have, what this says is give me 10 convolutions. So I'm not going to generate one image. I'm going to, from one input image, I'm going to generate 10 new images. Each of them is a convolution. I will use seven by seven filters, so not, di not three by three as in the previous image. I'm going to use seven by seven filters. This just says that I'm going to give you 28 by 28 image, uh, pixel images with one color channel. And then what we do after the convolutions, we throw away everything that's below zero. Uh, this flatten just says that we, are, we don't care about it being an image anymore. It's just a uh, array of numbers from this point on. So it just reshapes our image into a single ar uh, array, uh, one dimensional array. And then we have a familiar dense layer. And finally, an activation. And this is a different activation, softmax. Uh, it, what, the thing that you need to know about it is whenever you do this trick of uh, predicting for each uh, number. Uh, how likely it is, you have to use softmax instead of rare you. Uh, for what are the reasons for that? I'm going to let you find that out uh, later. Because it's not uh, hard, it just takes a lot of time to explain it. <laughs> uh, and then we are going to compile. And again, the loss is different. This, is, this goes hand in hand with the, with the softmax. Not important for our purposes right now. But what happens is, when I did that, then I get 92% uh, of the images correctly, which is quite amazing. We, we just did like, what, the seven lines of code plus another 10 to compile it and, and predict and fit. And we have a software that can get, sorry. Oh, I lost myself, OK. Where am I? OK, here. So this is, this is our original model. It's a few lines of code, and yet we can guess 92% accurately. What about, so what, what we can do after that? After that, I, I played around with it a bit. So I spent like half an hour. Half an hour later, I actually added a few more convolutions and activations. And I, I, I want to make sure you understand, I didn't have any clue what I'm doing. So I'm, I was like that dog in the meme, right? I had no idea what I'm doing. I just played around with it because that's what they do. Because it looked like we don't have enough, enough complexity. So I tried, tried to uh, increase the complexity until it got right. Uh, we could have like a million other uh, ways to do this. This is just one way. 
And probably that's why experimentation works, is because a lot of the things that you will try will turn out to be fine. But if you do that, if you experiment, experiment a bit, you can get to over 99%. Pretty good. And you can actually do that with any kind of images. So now we have this so, sm small little piece of software that can generate, num uh, that can actually find which number is written on a piece of paper. That's useful, but it's not something that you drops your jokes, right? So where, where you can go from this? What's next? Well, if you try to learn a bit more about this, you will find out that most of the time, people don't use just one, uh, one of these networks or models. For example, the AlphaGo, that bet the best human player in Go just a few months ago, was actually using two different models. It used one, one of these uh, models to predict what the opponent, opponent will move. So it, it, it could say, uh, if you were playing with a human, probably that human would put here or here or here. And with these probabilities. And then there was another uh, network that said, if that's, that these are the, the stones on the board. That's, that's the configuration of the stones. You're likely to win or you're likely to lose. That's, that's the other thing that they did. And then what they did, they used those two networks and coded up manually a, uh, an algorithm that would first just look at the board, uh, make a few moves according to uh, one of the networks that told you what are the likely moves, and then uh, after like five moves, they checked if, if that's a winning position or not. And that's, that's all they did. Of course, they have spent a whole lot of time experimenting with that. Uh, and, and, it, and I wouldn't, wouldn't I actually try to recreate it with, uh, for Gomoku. I didn't manage yet, but I'm pretty close. I'm pretty close. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but the thing is that you can, you can actually combine these things. And another interesting way that you can combine it is, for example, new, uh, the neural style. Uh, put your hands up if you use Prisma, Prisma app, if you know Prisma. Ah, surprising a few people. Uh, homework, download Prisma, it's awesome. So what it does, uh, you give it a picture of an artwork, and give it a picture that you just took with your phone, and it turns it into another picture that looks like what you looks like the thing you have taken the photo of, but it's painted in the style of the uh, style image. And I think this like cute, right? It's 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 really funny that you can do this. And the way it works is you have uh, two different neural networks: one that measures how close an image is in style to another image. So you, you measure the difference in style. And there, there is another neural network that measures the difference in content. Is this the same thing on those two images or not? And once you have that, then you can use those two things to generate a third neural network that is going to try to fool both of those things. So you start with a random image, and that neural network will try to turn that random image into something that looks a lot like, that, that fools both the content network and both the, the style network. Which I think is, is, is cute that it works like that. And yeah, and that's, that's one th thing that you can actually learn about later. Uh, then there is another direction you can go into. All of the things that we have done so far are pure functions. You don't have any state, but for uh, sound recognition you need state. So you can learn about things called LSTMs. Those are good for sound recognition and text recognition, stuff like that. Uh, and it, to do all that, you just have to go to that URL. Because Jeremy Howard, this is Jeremy Howard, awesome guy, he actually created a free AI course that you can just go through in, well, I think it's about 20 hours of video and he 
explains everything in great detail. He actually does the uh, number recognition similarly that, that, uh, similar to the way that I have done, uh, but he goes into the data. So he will explain you what softmax is and stuff like that. Uh, but of course, it takes more than an hour, so I couldn't do that. But go to that URL. He's really awesome. And, and the course is designed for developers who have no idea about math or no idea about uh, data science. It's designed for developers like you, OK? Uh, finally, I just want to do a, a small, small piece of self-promotion. So I have this workshop called Lean Poker. It's great for learning about agile and lean practices and how you can uh, deliver value really, really quickly in practice. And it's uh, like a fun one-day workshop. Uh, look for it. And the other thing I wanted to promote is my YouTube channel where I uh, talk with software professionals. We drive around town and we just discuss software topics. So that's all. Uh, thank you for your attention. And again, just the URL so you can uh, write them down or take a photo. Do we have any questions, maybe? Well, in that case, thank you for your attention.